have to learn as a comedian to ignore the people that are just not having a good time. Like if you're a comedian and you think like, and, and this is how we are in life, right? Like sometimes we feel like we're bombing on the stage that is life because although they got 700 out of a thousand people laughing and having a great time, they might look down and see one or two people on their phone or, you know, contemplating life. And, and the reality is you don't know what's going on in those people's lives and you're never going to impress every single person that's in front of you. And so I think a takeaway as a Louisville football or a Louisville basketball fan right now is not everybody's going to agree with you. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the general crux of sports in general. If we all agreed, then we wouldn't have this show. If we all just felt the same way and wanted to fan the same way and all shared the same opinions, then there would be no reason to have these nuanced discussions, right? Everybody's opinion varies. Your opinion varies from mine. My worldview varies from yours. That's just how it goes. And so when you're on the stage that is life and you're looking down at, you know, one person that's disagreeing with you or one person, it does a disservice to just pay attention to that. And I think at this point, what people have referred to is the, the KP mafia or the, you know, I, I don't know if there's negative connotations with KP mafia, people who continue to back him and continue to have this belief and say that you're a bad fan if, if you have something negative to say about the coaches or players. They don't believe they don't believe in the nuance of this conversation. And number two, they're bringing down other people and giving us, you know, it, it's, it's, it's right there for the taking to just kind of want to rant and to kind of want to go in on those type of types of people. And so as we have this conversation today, I want to have a conversation, uh, you know, for the 95% that are there and in, enjoying the show and not the 5% that are the, the loud minority. Uh, the reality is that there's, Th things are not even close to being up to par right now. And so I want to acknowledge that from a rational, level-headed point of view and try to look into the future and, and figure out how we can resolve this from a level-headed perspective and not focus, as I often find myself doing, on trying to convince anyone else to believe my opinion. I'd rather just share my opinion. I'd rather you share your opinion and us enjoy it in that way. So that's what we'll do today. On the Starting 502 podcast, as always, brought to you by Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon. As always, we are sipping on some Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon. Six different types, but which means that there's a flavor for everyone out there. Check them out at Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon.com. Be among the first to get in on what will be one of the most nationally re renowned bourbon brands sooner rather than later. As you know, the official bourbon of Louisville basketball legend. One of only two numbers, right? What, three numbers, four numbers? How many, how many numbers do we have retired? One of very That's few no questions. Yeah. Global basketball, the number two, the legendary Rusticulous Russ Smith, Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, Jay Cook, as we enter into this, this time of, of podcast, this sacred time that, that we have together, where we just kind of, it's turning into a vent session almost at this point, right? I think after the last podcast, we, you know, had some semblance of hope. We thought maybe there are reasons to think that they might be turning a corner and really the last two games have kind of fallen flat on their face. Jake, number one, how are you doing? And number two, uh, is, is that conversation just completely over? Are we back to kind of square one here? Yeah. Uh, I was doing a lot better 11 days ago following the win at Miami. Um, and I think we, we've shown some positive things, but I, I think we spoke about it in the podcast that, Though we won 80 to 71, there were still a lot of those glaring issues that we've seen all year, leaving three-point shooters wide open. We just happened to get lucky that Nigel Pack was 2 of 11 from the three-point line instead of shooting 47% like he normally does. So I think it was nice to see to get a win because those have been so few and far between over the last year and a half. I mean, I think we we saw a good fight against NC State. We saw periods of good fight against North Carolina, but then – it all kind of came crashing down, losing by 25 to Wake Forest. So uh, I've been better as a Cardinal fan, that's for sure. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, you know, we were sitting here just talking about, um, you know, what we were going to discuss on the podcast. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned North Carolina. 
it's like everything just is starting to run together a little bit now. And I, I know that our lives, especially this time of year, can get a little hectic as you're getting back into the flow of things. But uh, you, you j- just muted yourself. Sorry. Are you, are you're not you're not talking to me. You're talking to somebody else. Sorry. <laughs> my cat just puked everywhere, and I was trying to let my girlfriend know she just puked everywhere. Sorry oh, about that. Good. She literally just puked in the corner of my eye. And I was like, oh my god. Sorry, we're good now. I love it, dude. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> if we need to stop and, and clean up cat puke, we're totally we're we're not immune to uh the cat puke talk on, on the show. By the I'm way, are you welcome. are you dogless? Uh, I'm pretty sure you or do you have a dog and a cat? Is no, right? just just two cats. Yeah. We will just eventually get a dog. We're looking at houses now, so we'll eventually get a dog, but we would like a fenced in backyard before we do that. Yeah, that's the key, man. That's the key, especially on days like today. Oh, yeah. Or days like yesterday, uh, as we're recording in January 21st, where you feel like you're taking your poor dog for a walk and their pee is going to freeze midair. Uh, one of those situations. The key is to get them a little fence so they can enjoy their own world and, and make the decision when they actually get to go to the bathroom. Uh, but no, get, getting into this this kind of conversation about the last few games, you know, the last time we recorded was after the Miami game. And I was thinking there was just two games since then. But there's actually been three games. And that's what happens when you kind of have this Groundhog Day state of affairs, if you will, where <laughs> it feels like every game is the same as the last. Maybe the narrative's a little bit different, but ultimately, uh, depending on what side you are on, it ultimately is a comedy or a tragedy, right? At, at, at the end of at the end of the day, there's not a lot of room for for nuance there. It's <laughs> we know what the ending is going to be. It's just we're just learning different ways of how that outcome comes about, if you will. Um, and, and that there's that's a new spin just, on the last game, 17 minutes from Zan Payne. That was a new way to lose. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I think that's a lot of what we got want to get into. Right. And I think that's another, just of the other, the, the many frustrating things about this era of Louisville basketball, it's not just the play on the floor. Like I think that fans would be able to kind of take this more like, adults maybe or take this in stride a little bit more and and see more optimism in the future maybe even see optimism still with Kenny Payne if it weren't for everything that happens off the floor there's so much that happens on the floor that's bad and inexcusable but we can kind of look past that uh, in, in a different light if it weren't for everything that happens off the court and that's kind of where I sit now, like every storyline that I think about, everything that I write down about this team, every note that I take, it feels like it's more just a frustration with the way that Kenny Payne views things and the way that he kind of is almost, I don't know if belittling is the right word, but he's almost just, he, he thinks that we're dumber than we actually are. I, I think that's that's my takeaway from from the Kenny Payne situation with the press conferences and, and the poor handling of players and the poor handling of recruiting and the poor handling of the coaching situation and the just overall lack of awareness or understanding of what it could be the coach of this program. That's the more frustrating part to me, even than, you know, sit, sitting there and watching Zan Payne play 17 minutes uh, in a game at Lake Forest. I think the more frustrating, the more frustrating part is just trying to understand you know, the, the, the perspective that pain is coming from because it's not any world realm of reality that I live in. I, I mean, I'm almost wondering, like, is he trying to get fired? Like he was like, let's start Danilo tonight. Let's see if that'll get me out of here. Nope. Okay. Let's put a walk on and Danilo in the starting lineup. They still got me around. Let me put my overweight son in the starting lineup. Let me see if that changes things. Like, I don't understand. I mean, there's clearly, you could argue with the health that we have right now, there's six, maybe seven guys that should be in the starting lineup. And those do not include Hersey, Danilo, or Zan Payne. So, and every single night he comes out with a combination of some of those three in the starting lineup. And we're down nine to four after the first four minutes, or we're down 11 to two, or we're down eight to zero, whatever it is. Like we start off in such a hole because he has this thought that one of those three guys needs to start, but then not play any more minutes after the start. I don't it philosophically it makes absolutely no sense. The going back a little bit to 
earlier this week, the thing that kind of really just struck a chord with me and I think many other fans uh, based on reaction to what we put out on Twitter, just from, you know, conversations in person with Louisville fans was Kenny's response when asked about him inheriting uh, a, you know, some, a, a different situation than, than Hubert Davis. And he basically suggested he didn't in- inherit the same thing as Hubert Davis, which in a very small way yes like there were there were differences and there's going to be difference in every situation but he expressed his envy of of what hubert davis inherited and the reality of the situation is kenny Payne continues to kind of talk out of both sides of his mouth and he continues to just indicate that that Louisville is was just a an, an unsalvageable situation almost and he's also said things like uh, in, 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 in different press conferences that he didn't view his first year as a starting point that was year zero for him and this is year one and it, it to me it's, it's it's comedy uh and you know I, I probably should have saved this for a little bit more you know, well thought out article than a, you know, a five minute rant on, on Twitter. But I mean, the, the, the reality is that as, as we suggested already, it, it's a groundhog day situation, right? It feels like our patients ran its course last year and we're continuing to see, you know, the different ways that Louisville can lose and, and look at net. And it's not that they're just losing by five or six points and, oh, if they just turn this around, then things will get better. It's blowout loss after blowout loss. And when you beat a Miami team by nine on the road, it's the most shocking thing that's happened in your tenure. And that, that's, a, that's a huge red flag. And he continues to, to have no understanding or at least express no understanding of just how dire the situation is. And he talks like a guy who's going to have four or five more years at Louisville and that eventually maybe year eight, then they'll have a winning record and maybe then they can talk about the NCAA tournament, but it's not steeped in reality because the reality is that there were what 12 power five hires uh, in, in the last two years and not a single coach right now is below 500, but for some reason at Louisville where the resources are the best, where there's the most money, where there's some of the most passionate fans, when you have the, the biggest and nicest arena in the country, when you have the best facilities, when you have a, 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 the 502 circle, which is one of the premier uh, fundraising programs for to help players take advantage of NIL, when you have all of these resources and you ignore all of them and you ignore people that are trying to help you, you ignore opportunities to, to, to bring in new coaches, to take advantage of new rules. When you ignore all of this and then continue to just complain and say, you know, poor old me, you guys don't understand how bad the situation, you don't understand. He is 100% responsible and to insinuate that it's year one, which is absolute bullshit because we saw last year coaches take over just as bad as situations and come in and lead their teams to turn to the tournament and even go on NCAA tournament runs. When you continue to say that, when you continue to say that what you inherited in North Carolina is just, or at Louisville is so vastly different than North Carolina and Hubert Davis it's, it's a slap in the face. It is because it's implying that we just don't know how bad it is. We just don't understand. And the reality is that the coach before him, Chris Mack had it way worse than what Kenny Payne had. He actually had that dark cloud over his head because he was recruiting kids to play to school that they had no idea when or if punishments would be levied. And before Kenny Payne ever coached a, a game at the university of Louisville, that cloud officially went away. And by the way, there were no punishments. There were no sanctions on the program. Anything significant, right? It was a slap on the wrist at worst in, in, in terms of, of what it could have been, especially given all, all, all of the previous violations, right? And so he comes in and takes over a program that we, you know, apparently we just don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. We don't understand just how bad it is. And to me, that's just an absolute slap in the face, Jake. Even if it, I, his baffling logic of this is year one somehow, this still wouldn't be acceptable in year one. 
six and 12, one and six in conference, like losses to terrible non-conference teams like Chattanooga and like just getting your ass kicked on a nightly basis in ACC play, like that wouldn't be acceptable either. So like, even if somehow you were able to logically get your head around the fact that this is year one, this still wouldn't be okay. Like this, this season alone is a fireable offense, not even thinking back to a four and 28 or four and 26 year, the year prior. So to me, it, it, it makes no sense. And like, he's now had control of the roster for two seasons, at least one full season. These are the players he wanted. And I don't even think talent is the issue. I think it's the fact that they haven't been coached properly. They still don't know how to run a baseline out of bounds play. I think we saw three different times where we had a baseline out of bounds play against UNC and just threw the ball to the other team Two just going for live ball turnovers and an easy layup on the other end. It's like, those are things you teach fourth graders how to do not 19, 20, 21 year old kids. Like those aren't even things we should have to be worrying about at all. And yet we can't even accomplish those. When I say that Kenny Payne is talking out of both side of, sides of his mouth, here's what I mean. You have players that you recruited to this program, right? So let's go back to the very beginning, right? Kenny decided that there were certain players that he didn't want as a part of this program. And some of those players have gone on to have excellent careers and would have been very beneficial to this team in this very moment, right? That's number one. Then he went out and did not complete his roster. He didn't add any guards and basically had LLS and Hersey Miller last year. He brought in Hersey Miller as a quote unquote scholarship player. But the reality is that Hersey is kind of a lower level. I'm, Hersey is not a, a bad guard, but he's not the Louisville standard. And then you have L. Ellis, who has since transferred to Arkansas and has, you know, not seen a lot of playing time at Arkansas on an absolute cluster of, 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 of a team. That was your best player last year. And you opted to just ride, ride with L and Hersey and Zan Payne last season, right? And I always go back to this uh, when I was listening to to Steve Steve Rummage and Marcus Mabin in the offseason. And Steve laughing and saying, you guys really think that Coach Payne isn't going to go out and get another guard? He's like, of course he's going to go out and get another guard, probably two more guards. And then <laughs> he's like, oh, we're going to start the season. All of a sudden there's no guards. But that's exactly what happened. And I always remember that moment because I was like, Steve, that's such a good point. Like, Louisville's going to bring in somebody. They're going to bring in, they're going to bring in at least a body to play at the guard position. And they didn't even do that. They played the entirety of last year without a point guard. Hey, don't forget Fabio Basile. Diamond in the rough. I, I apologize, Fabio Basile. <laughs> um, but I always think, I always think back to that. Like nobody understood the ineptitude that would, that would come with this hire. Everybody. I mean, you go back to the, to the Josh Hurd press conference. Uh, or not the job, the introductory press conference and Josh heard talking about the hiring of Kenny Payne. And he said that, you know, there wasn't, a, and he said this, he really re reiterated this multiple times, governor Andy Bashir, which again, he doesn't really have much to do except for come, come in and, you know, be rah, rah and get people fired up. But Bashir came in, the president at the time, Lori Gonzalez came in, Josh heard who at the time was an interim athletic director came in. And they all stood there and said, this is the best possible hire that we could make. Unequivocally, the best hire we could make. And then Kenny came in, and the things that he was built to do, he did not even come close to doing last season. He was terrible in recruiting, terrible at, at assembling a roster, terrible at coaching up the players. And then you go into this offseason, and we say, okay, well, maybe, you know, we can cut him a little bit of slack because, you know, we don't really know what happened behind the scenes. Maybe something happened where he could only get, what, nine, ten scholarship players, not fill the roster. Uh, you know, maybe he had some guards in the bag and it, something fell through at the last second. They couldn't find a replacement. Whatever the case was, let's give him a break. Uh, you know, year one was what it was, but it's all right. Then we go into year two, and essentially the same thing happens, right? the same kind of recruiting tac tactics. And I can tell you right now, Jake, and tell the listeners that they had players on the back. The coaching, the assistant coaches 
who are great at building relationships, especially Nolan, Nolan Smith, great at building relationships. They had players in the back. And Kenny didn't pick up the phone. The 502 circle was able to offer players more than pretty much anybody else in the country could. And as you know, the University of Louisville is able to offer perks, um, you know, benefits of coming to the university, the tradition, the facilities, everything that comes with being a Louisville basketball player, the accolades. They're able to offer that plus probably more money than almost anybody in the country was offering at the time. They had these guys in the bag, and Kenny just didn't pick up the phone. He didn't want players that were coming to Louisville because of NIL. And so when he says, you know, in the offseason, he said he indicated essentially if there are issues, it's going to be because of me. It's going to be my fault because this is a team that I recruited. And so that's the frustrating part is that Kenny had many opportunities to assemble this roster. So when I say that he's talking out of both sides of his mouth, now he's saying that he can't get the kids to understand it's the kids, it's the kids, it's the kids. The reality is that you get paid over $3 million, $3 million a year to, to coach these kids up, to make this a formidable program, to make this a formidable roster. And that's the part that's so maddening, Jake. Yeah, I mean, you said it. There were players, there were guards that we could have gotten. Like, you know who would have been a great player to have? Hunter Salas, who just put up like 27 on us. Like that was a guy that was interested in coming here and we thought was mutual. We were mutually interested in him, but he doesn't go there. Keon Minifield goes to Arkansas to redshirt. RJ Lewis is at St. John's putting up 12 points a game. Like there were so many names that were out there during the transfer portal season that I think we very easily could have gotten with all of the NIL and everything, the guard spots that we had available, the playing time we had available. Cause we didn't have Tyler at that point. It was literally Sky Clark. And then Mike James playing the two, three, but I mean, the only true guard we had on the roster that time was Sky Clark. There were plenty of opportunities for players to come players to get NIL players to come to a program. that's so good. And yet we just looked at them and said, no, thanks. We're good. We don't need, we don't need Hunter Salas. He can go put up 19 a game at wake. We don't need RJ Lewis. He can put up 12 points per game with Rick Pitino. We don't need Keon Minifield. He'd rather somehow redshirt at Arkansas than come get playing after being like pac 12 all freshman team. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. The roster construction and the coaching and the scouting, the recruiting, everything. But then beyond that, he's somehow worse in the media. Like he's somehow worse than all of that when he talks to the press. So like it's just truly ineptitude at levels I don't think I've ever been seen at a program at this high of a level. So uh, we had some hope in the Miami game after NC State, but we're just right back to it where it's just really, really hard to – feel any positive feelings it is man and i i like the you know the, the kid that commented on twitter the other day and said you know i remember being enjoying a little basketball but now every game that i watch is you know or it feels like every game i watch is misery and i was like oh i mean it's it, it's it's still miserable it's just we're just always in misery <laughs> and i think that's why the miami game gave us so much uh you know false optimism if you will because it was so distinctly different than what we're used to seeing it's the yeah. only positivity we've had in like real Years. true positivity like beating a like an actual team that i'm like yeah like they could make the ncaa tournament like being like we've been competitive with teams that are good but we've never beaten a potentially ncaa tournament level teams so that's the first time i mean that was the best feeling I've had in a year and a half. And that's really sad to say, because now it looks like Miami's not even that good. Yeah. I mean, it, it could ultimately end up being a fraudulent win. It's kind of like uh, last year against Clemson when they kind of just hit everything. They kind of fed off. I think it was the 1983 team or maybe the 1986 team that they recognized last season. Uh, and at that Clemson game, a lot of people showed up. It was a good atmosphere and they just like, just pulled a lot of stuff out of their ass and Clemson played about as bad as possible. And that's kind of what I'm starting to feel like in the rear view is like Miami's probably gonna get to the end of the season and that bad loss could ultimately end up costing them down the road. Yeah. We're and, hanging a banner. It's going to say kept Miami out of the tournament 2024. That's going to be our banner yeah. for this year. Next to the 2023 kept Clemson out of the tournament. Back yeah, to back baby. 
but it, it's it's so funny now looking at the rest of the schedule. I mean, Louisville plays Duke on Tuesday, and nobody in their right mind <laughs> is is thinking that Louisville is going to come even close to pulling this out. It's going to be not as bad as the Kentucky game in my estimation, but pretty close as far as there will be a ton of Duke fans there. They're going to take advantage of, you know, Louisville sucking and not filling the arena. I'm sure there'll be two, three, 4,000 Duke fans there, which would be great. You know, I, I love when blue teams come in and just take over our arena. North Carolina has done that in the past as well. Uh, but I mean, you look ahead to, you know, I mean, you got Duke, North Carolina, Virginia, like th- these, those are games that nobody in their right mind should be expecting Louisville to win at this point. And it, it's, it's weird, you know, Duke on a Tuesday night and towards the end of January, like that's that's something that we look forward to for months at, at previously prior to Kenny Payne. Even under Chris Mack, even in the 13 and 19 season, like we're filling up the KFC Yum Center. We're looking at this in, in a huge positive light as a way to, you know, a, a reprieve from the darkness and the coldness and the grossness that is January, right? And I have a work obligation on Tuesday night. I'm not going to be able to be at the game and really couldn't care less. Like, it's kind of a bummer that I won't be able to go, but it's like, it's such a different vibe and feeling than any season prior that that any of us have experienced in our lifetimes. And I mean, I think the one thing that, that I'd say to people who are still kind of supportive of Kenny Payne I want this team to be successful. I want to see them win. But it's clear from from everything that we've seen that it's just not going to happen. And so I guess that brings me to the question of what what good at this point is keeping Kenny Payne? Like what 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 what's the reasoning behind it? Obviously the financials come into play, but I don't think it's as cut and dry as we make it either. I don't think it's like, okay, well, we have to wait till April 1st to fire him to save $2 million. I don't think it's as cut and dry as that. I think that Josh Hurd, as an experienced AD is probably looking at the situation and already having discussions with Kenny's agent already having discussions with Kenny and those around him and the coaching staff and administrators. I'm sure there's a plan in place. Conversations have already been had, but I'm wondering how bad it has to get. For them to lay him off, but to me, to, go go ahead. Sorry, I don't I don't know if there is like we we're ten and thirty something at this point. Like I don't know if there is a level of losing and ineptitude that will bring this athletic program to fire him. Like I really don't. I mean, it made so ten and forty after the after the loss on Saturday. Sorry, now we're in the forties now. I mean, Christmas break was the perfect time. We had eleven days off. That made so much sense to bring in an interim coach level up either Nolan or Danny or bring in someone completely outside of the program. I mean, that's when it made sense. And I think the athletic programs made it pretty clear that we're just kind of stuck here. And when April 1st comes and that buyout drops by $2 million, then we can have a discussion. It seems like, but I mean, even at that point, that's late to the game. You're going to have coaches that are already bounced out of the NCAA tournament. And can you really sit there for 10 more days and wait and hope that they don't take that, that, that better promotion or that just as good promotion from a Michigan state job that opens up or a UCLA job that opens up. So, I mean, even to me that April 1st date doesn't make a ton of sense either. So I, it, I, I don't think we're moving anything. It doesn't. And I don't think that that's how it'll work. Okay. Uh, I, I think that if they co- if they go to Kenny and tell him that, you know, they're thinking about moving on from him or they go to his a- you know, however this works behind the scenes. I think that there will be a conversation where I think Kenny Payne and his agents and people around him, they can have a nuance enough of a conversation to say, okay, it's 15 days before, you know, your contract buyout drops and have a conversation that way. You know, can we prorate the final 15 days? Something of that nature. I highly, highly doubt that it's like, they have to wait until April 1st on the day of April 1st to, to fire him. I, I, I don't think that's how, how it will go. 
And so with, with that in mind, I don't look at it like that. I look at it as at this point, I feel like we're wasting time because at least if you make a move, then that signals nationally that Louisville is looking to move forward. And I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind. I think they need that time. I think we need this bridge. I don't, I don't like the idea of there being, you know, Kenny Payne just finishing out the season and then there just being no gap, no reprieve from the Kenny Payne era. Uh, I, I think that if you want to keep the program together, if there are players on this roster that you'd like to keep here, I think they need to have a good understanding of what the culture, what the brand is like, what it's supposed to be like. Because as we've said in previous episodes, Jake, there are tons of fans that will come out and support this team without Kenny Payne. And I think, say, in two weeks, you fire Kenny Payne. I don't know what, what the exact right time is. I'm not sure exactly what we're, we're, we're waiting for. And I don't think anybody really knows. Um, but say it's in two weeks and they announce that they're letting go of Kenny Payne. I think immediately, if you're playing, uh, I'm trying to think of who, who they play in, in, in February, but let's say Virginia. So you're playing Virginia at home and you let go of Kenny. Next game is Virginia. I guarantee you 10,000 plus people will show up. It'll be the loudest, the most raucous, the most supportive crowd that they've had all season. And I think it's important to remember who we are as a program. I think it's important to make that distinction of, you know, in the interim, what the University of Louisville basketball is. And you don't have that opportunity and you lose all of that momentum if you just go from, okay, let Kenny finish out the season, let just let it die naturally, and then immediately hire a new coach. Because that's, that's how it would go if you didn't let him off, uh, lay him off midseason. I mean, we saw it with Mike Pegues. We brought an interim in. Energy changed. More fans came. Players played Absolutely. harder. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I mean, there's clearly – there's a formula in the past that has worked and will clearly work again if a change is made. And I think the bigger thing is we had the conversation, and we can dive deeper in it in another episode, but at this point, we're not making the NCAA tournament. we got to figure out what players we still want on this roster for next year. And within a net of a head coach as we have right now – it's hard to tell like how much of this is the players not knowing what to do, not being up to that skill level and how much is just, they're not properly prepared. They're not given a proper game plan to beat these teams. So, I mean, to me, like, I don't think it'll happen, but I would love to see an interim come in and change philosophies, be a better coach and give us a better idea of is Curtis Williams a potential star here, or is he just a, a freshman that likes to shoot the ball? Because right now, I don't know. He could he could be either. You really don't know. And I don't think he's given a fair chance to show what he could be. Same with Caleb Glenn. Same with Sky Clark, even. They're all put in these situations where they're probably having to do too much and they're not properly prepared to play as good, as well as they can. So I, I think you're right. I think an interim is the right move, but at this point, I just don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean – It's a great point, Jake. I mean, energy is everything. And clearly, I mean, you look at Louisville's most recent game against who they just play, Wake Forest. I always get Wake Forest, and especially with Passner on the call on Saturday, he's really Mm -hmm. confusing (laughs) with Wake Forest and Georgia Tech because in basketball, they feel like such similar programs, Mm -hmm. like in every every capacity, all the way down to, like, their color scheme. So, Oh, I get them confused all the time. So against Wake Forest, I mean, look, I posted the the Zan Payne defensive highlights on Sunday morning. I mean, you he's a, he's a projected second round pick after you posted those, dude. You can't in your right mind come out and say that you thought that Zan Payne was all right on defense when if you just pay attention to that half the time in in those highlights he was just on the wrong side of the floor. <laughs> And it's little stuff like that. People are like, okay, well, how are they keep getting so many open shots? It's because players legitimately do not know what they're supposed to do. I think it's clear as day that especially on defense, players have no idea what they're supposed to do. Now, they will defend hard when they're playing well on the offensive end. Don't get me wrong. But it's impossible to close out on a shot when you're in the paint. Like, if if, if a guy has a wide-open three-point shot, as much as as Sky Clark and Tyler Johnson and Caleb Glenn 
you know, try to run them off the three point line. When you're running from the paint and the guy has the time to set his feet and shoot, this is high level college basketball. I don't care if it's Georgia Tech, Wake Forest, Duke, North Carolina, Kentucky. I don't care who it is. That shot's going in and you're going to have zero opportunity. So these guys are they're, they're just simply out of position. They don't know what they're doing. The game plan is not getting through to the players. And as we've said multiple times now, it's up to the coaches to, to make that happen. But one thing that I'll bring up as well, Jake, is that I think in, in, in my mind, if there's anybody that's on the staff that, that stays after Payne is let go, I think it's Nolan Smith. I think that's the only obvious move. Like, I, I'm not sure what Josh Jamison does. I'm sorry. I don't know what that dude does. They have two other coaches on the staff uh, outside of Kenny Payne and – well, I'm blanking on his name um, – former head coach. Danny Manning? Danny Manning. Outside of KP and Danny Manning, they have Nolan Smith. They have Josh Jamison. And then did you know there's two other full-time coaches on the staff as well? I did not. I know I've seen more people, but I've never known who they are. Yeah. So so Louisville has two other full-time coaches on, on the staff as well. And that's what I always kind of hint at when we're talking about, okay, well, you had an opportunity to retool the, retool the staff. And basically what the NCAA did was because of the changing rules, they're allowing two more staff members to recruit and actually sit on the bench, be coaches, be at all the practices, uh, assume the role of what Jamison and Payne and Danny Manning and Nolan Smith were doing previously. Uh, so they added instead, um, man, I'm really bad with names right now. They added. Uh, <laughs> Danny Manning, the, Danny Manning, Grant Josh Jamison. Uh, Grant Paul. Grant Paul of the current UK. Oh, Milt, Milt Wagner. Wagner. Milt Wagner is now part of the staff. Uh, and then there's one other coach that I can't even, could even begin to think of what his name is. So Louisville has other full-time coaches on the staff. Regardless, a lot of people don't know that. They could have brought in some new, bright, young minds, at least tried. And they said, nah, what we got is good. Just promote them. Get more money, whatever. But I do think that Nolan Smith would be the guy to take over if you don't make an outside hire. And I think it's going to come out, whether it's in a week, two weeks, three months, it's going to come out how disconnected this coaching staff has been. Nolan Smith is not a bad basketball coach. He's not a bad recruiter. Uh, but he's being handcuffed based on what his boss instructs him to do. And I think that'll come out. And I think that players would want to play for Nolan. Like, I think if they, you know, if Josh Hurd and the Louisville administration goes to the players and says, look, we it, we have to do this as a business decision. We got to get rid of Coach Payne. Whoever stays, stays, but we'd like Nolan Smith to be the the interim coach. I think players would play hard for, for him. I think they'd play a lot better because I think they just have a better understanding of what they're supposed to do. And there is this, you know, just because you're a good player doesn't mean you're a good coach. And Kenny has always indicated that, oh, no, I have the best coaching staff. I have such good coaching staff. Do you even understand how good of a player Danny Manning was? Do you even understand how good of a, a player Nolan Smith was and, and – so on and so forth. The reality is that some of the best players are not good coaches. I mean, we've seen this over and over again. There's this trend in college basketball of hiring for, former star players, and it not, you know, most of the time it doesn't pan out. You think Rick Patino was some just unbelievable all star player in, in college? I mean, the reality is he wasn't, but he's a great coach. He's a great leader. And so there's a difference. And for Kenny to just sit there and keep just basically bloviating and just thinking that he is so much better than everybody else. And he understands so much better and he knows so much better. The reality is he's just not, he's not made to be a head coach in college basketball. There's a reason why he was such a good number two at UK. There's a reason why he was such a good assistant for the Knicks. And that's because he's probably not fit to be the number one guy. He doesn't have the chops to do, what it takes to be the head coach. And that's fine to say. That's fine. That happens in jobs everywhere, every single day, all around the world. People get hired into positions that they're not fit for. And what happens is they have to move on. And that person goes on to have a career somewhere else. And that's totally fine. And that's what has to happen with Kenny at this point. And I think that the transition 
I would hope that it would be Nolan. I'd hope that the players would be behind that. And I think that you could see something similar to what happened with Mike Pegues. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you say. I just everything that the athletic department has done and said when it comes to like money and keeping them this long, I just feel like I'm getting my hopes up, hoping that a change will come when in reality, it's more likely that we're stuck here for another two months, just watching the same thing. Maybe, maybe winning on the road in Clemson in January or beating Syracuse at home in February, whatever it is like those are, that's what we're going to have to live on now is like, we beat Georgia Tech and Boston College back to back, and we'll get our hopes up for a little bit, and then we'll go lose to Pitt and Duke and Virginia Tech after that. So I, uh, I don't know. It's tough. I want to try and keep a positive mindset, but it is uh, becoming more and more difficult as the as the season rolls on. Really quickly, elsewhere in the ACC, uh, it is going to be an exciting conference season, especially as we come down the stretch. We talked about how Louisville's schedule is so front loaded. I mean, they're playing you know, the top, they've already played the top three teams in the conference right now. North Carolina is still undefeated in conference seven and zero. Wake Forest is five and two. NC State's five and two. And that's actually, that's the last three teams Louisville's played. Uh, Louisville's also about to face Duke. They've already faced Virginia. They've already faced Miami. So basically they're, they are playing the, the, what is now the top half of the conference, but it's going to get really fascinating uh, a, as we move uh you know, deeper into conference season, do you have, do you think there's a prohibitive favorite favorite right now in the ACC? Is there a team that you look at and you think, yeah, that's a, that's a team that's final four caliber. I mean, to me, it's, it's UNC for sure. Obviously. I mean, they've got guards, they've got Armando Baycott, they've got experience with RJ Davis. They've got young guards with Elliot Cadeau. I mean, they really have everything that you need. They've got enough shooting to keep them in games in case they're down. They seem to play good enough defense. They've got a dominant big. So, I mean, I think UNC is clearly the favorite. To, if anybody in the ACC is going to make a Final Four run, it's them. I haven't seen as much of Wake Forest as I have UNC just because they're not on TV as much. But obviously, I just saw them whoop our ass for 40 minutes a couple of days ago. Um, but, I mean, that's a very well-rounded team. They're getting more and more guys healthy every single week, it seems like. And, I mean, they've just got shooters on shooters on shooters. Uh, so, I mean, that's another team that could easily make a, a Final Four run. Duke's got the talent. I know they're not playing up to their standard. They're not terrible, but just lost to Pitt at home. So that's not a great loss right there. But those, I think, are probably our three most talented teams in the ACC right now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's def- it's it sucks, too, that Louisville's this bad in a pretty down ACC where, you know, five years ago we're used to seeing a guaranteed seven, eight, sometimes even nine NCAA tournament teams. And now we'll be lucky to get four, maybe five is what it looks like right now. Yeah, and, and that's, again, that's right now, you know. Uh, if we went back and looked at all the Rick Pitino teams that were kind of quasi on the bubble uh, and, and then ultimately ended up being like a four seed or a six seed or, what, you know, what, whatever it was, somewhere like, you know, right in the middle of the pack in the NCAA tournament, uh, I, I think that you, there's a lot of that going on in the ACC right now. Uh, I think that you have an NC State team that is legit. I think you have a Syracuse team that could surprise a lot of people. Uh, Virginia, again, is going to be right there. I know right now they're sitting at 13 and five, but Virginia is the type of team that's going to pull some upsets against the North Carolina, against the Duke, uh, you know, Miami, one of those types of teams. And then there's some other quality teams. You know, it's really just about who's going to get hot and make a run at the right time. I don't think that Miami, I think right now, when I say the, the Miami win is fraudulent, Miami's in a, a they're just in, in a, a downfall right now. But that doesn't mean with excellent players returning from a final four team, they had a, a kind of a similar trial last season. If, if you, re, you remember, they really had to go on a, on a nice little run uh, to to get a, a quality seed in the NCAA tournament. I think that Miami is going to be right there when it's all said and done. Uh, you know, Virginia Tech, Boston College, Pitt all have quality wins already in conference, uh, and they're going to you know be a, hard, a tough out for anybody. So yeah, there's not there's not that typical like right yeah there's seven teams that could win the conference. I think it's clear cut that North Carolina. Is, is the prohibited favorite uh, to, to win the ACC. With, with that being said, I think you could still see seven, eight teams sneak in. And that's not great news for Louisville. I mean, even Notre Dame right now is looking like they're an improving team. Uh, so a- every single night from here on out, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult for Louisville to find wins. Uh, and I mean, I, I think right now we're, we're, we're not favored in a single game the rest of the season, right? I think at one point we were favored over Notre Dame, and then as the season's right. gone on and we've continued to lose, we're 
now not even favored in that game either. So yeah, it's it's an uphill battle for the rest of the season. Definitely, definitely. And and looking across the the college basketball landscape, I think this is going to be a, re- a really exciting finish to the season. And this will be a great NCAA tournament uh, because there's a lot of really quality teams. I think UConn once again is the favorite to win it all. Uh, especially they just got Donovan Klingon back, uh, who was a, a force in the tournament last year when they ultimately ended up winning it all. Uh, Purdue is is going to be out for blood, obviously, because of the way that they got bounced from the tournament last season. Uh, and, and Zach Eady is just just unbelievable. I mean, it, it, anybody who hasn't gotten a chance to watch Purdue, I mean, that guy is he's one of the best players that we've seen in college basketball in, in, in the last decade. So, and again, Kansas is great. North Carolina is great. Houston's an excellent team. Duke, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, all great teams. Baylor's a great team. Uh, Memphis, at, kind of out of nowhere, but on the rise. Uh, Arizona, again, was number one in the country at one point. They're 12th now. Uh, there, there are probably 10 to 15 teams that you can look at going down this list, even if you go down to, like, Marquette and Creighton, uh, you know, Ole Miss. Like, there are plenty of teams that are going to be in the mix when things are said and done. So, Although Louisville basketball is is down tremendously, I probably watched less college basketball this season than ever before. Uh, I think part part of that's because, you know, it's just so depressing to watch Louisville and then go watch like a UConn or a Houston play basketball. And it doesn't even feel like the same sport, you know. Um, but I think there's going to be some excitement uh, th- this season heading into the NCAA tournament. And I think there's some teams start, starting to kind of separate themselves from the pack I hate to say it, but I really like this Kentucky team, uh, especially now that they've just added Big Z, who looks like, I mean, is he going to start for them all of a sudden? That dude is, that dude's a beast. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Or is it, do, do you have two or three teams that you're looking out for that, you know, you think could win it all? Or do you think it's more wide open than ever? I mean, I was literally about to say the same thing as you, UK, the last, I mean, obviously last game with Big Z coming back, but I mean, they look like the most dominant offensive team. And then they just added a 12.8 rebound a guy per game. If he gets in the starting lineup to their roster, that was already top 10. So, I mean, to me, that team makes the most sense. I mean, they're still young. So as you see it all the time, they're going to grow. They're going to continue to get better as the season goes on. I mean, if they can just get stops, they're going to put up 90 a game, like easily. There's, there's just really no stopping that offense. There's just so much talent, so much skill everywhere. I mean, I like I like UNC. Um, obviously, we just saw them. They, they have some weaknesses, as you saw. We went on like a fifteen to four run or something to start the second half. So, not one hundred percent sold on that. Purdue every single year seems to be great in the Big Ten, and then they somehow find a way to lose in the tournament, even though they've got the largest human ever to exist in college basketball. Uh, another team I like, I like TCU a lot. I went there, so I'm a little bit biased there, but I, I love that style, that frenetic run and gun press you, get in your face, play good defense. I think that always translates well in the tournament. Their biggest issue is they just have no shooters. Like they're hit, they're hitting four threes a game and and that's okay. They can still win like that because you're only going to score 69 on them. But I mean, there's there's so many good teams. I'm with you. I used to I used to watch so much more college basketball because I'd watch Kansas and I'd be like, oh, we could see them in the Elite Eight. We can beat that team. Oh, dude, Shane Bahannon would dominate him. Like, so whatever it was. But now I watch right. and I'm like, I know I'm never going to see this team play Louisville. Like, unless they somehow make the, what is it, the CBI tournament, then I'm not going to see this team. <laughs> Do you think, you know, we talked about TCU. Uh, they're once again kind of on, on the come up. Do you think that we should be talking more about Jamie Dixon? I, you know, I... Know I well, I was going to say he's he's an alumnus of, of TCU, right? So that was kind mm-hmm. of his reasoning for making the move there. But yeah, go ahead. What, what What's your opinion on that as somebody who has a little bit more insight than anybody else? It was weird. He uh, he came, he was at Pittsburgh and obviously dominated. And then he kind of hit a lull in his career. And then he moved to TCU. And when I was there, we made the TCU made the NCAA tournament for the first time and god i want to say 20 years it was it had been a really long time since they'd made it but he didn't really have the players nor the play style that he has now but since i graduated i mean he's not pittsburgh rough and tumble like he was where it's just like just dirty like big men and just putting putting 10 points in your face with every single big man they have um it's a little bit more frenetic more fast paced but I like the way he plays. It's kind of similar to Patino and the fact that like the team doesn't really have a lot of shooters, but they have a lot of really good guards and they play so hard and they're going to press your face off. So if we hired Jamie Dixon, it wouldn't be my number one hire, but I wouldn't be upset by it at all. Yeah. I I think it's a name 
you know, when Jacob and I were, we, we were kind of doing, I'm not even sure this ever saw the light of day. Because there was a point where we really thought that Kenny Payne was going to be gone by Christmas. Like we legitimately, truly in our hearts believe that. Uh, and so I think we actually did like an hour on coaching candidates and that never saw the light of day because, well, uh, here we are, you know, over a month later and still no Kenny Payne being fired or any talk about it really. So one of the coaches that I brought up though was Jamie Dixon. And I thought that Jacob was a fan of that as well. Again, it's hard to pry a guy away from his alma mater, but, the difference between TCU and Louisville is kind of like the difference between Louisville and Ohio state and football, right? Like mm -hmm. there's just not a lot of tradition there, not a lot of history of success, not the same resources. So uh, really, I mean, ultimately it comes down to who, who the person is, but like, like you said, he wouldn't be my first choice, but I mean, Jamie Dixon would be infinitely better than, than what we have right now. Uh, final thoughts, you know, heading into, you know, looking towards Duke. Uh, and looking towards, you know, kind of the rest of the schedule until we speak with you guys again. Uh, I'm not sure there's much that I'm looking forward to trying to see uh, from Louisville against Duke besides I just want to see the right people start and play the most amount of minutes. Like if I have to watch Zan Payne play more minutes than Tyler Johnson and more minutes than Curtis Williams again, I'm going to freaking lose my mind. Uh, and I, I, I want to see the right players play. I want to see the lot, right mix of players play. I want to see the, you know, the right lineups, the, the, the lineups that have been most successful playing. That seems like something obvious that one would want to see from their favorite team. Um, and then what I is, just want what to see your, what is your preferred lineup? That's a great question. And I think that's something that we wanted to get into, but I would say, so I, I would say one at this point of Tyler or Sky. Mm -hmm. And I think that Louisville has gotten to the point now where they can play them interchangeably. Like they don't have to play with Tyler and Sky to be the most effective team. So I'm going to say either Sky or Tyler. And then I like Mike James at the two. I like having a big two. And I think that he can be his most successful uh, at, at the two because he's going to be a lot bigger than most twos that are matching up with him. Uh, he can put the ball on the floor better than almost anybody on the team. Um, and he's, probably Louisville's first or best second best uh, three-point shooter uh, and then at the three I know a lot of people aren't going to like this but I, I I like Curtis Williams over Trey White at this point uh, oh, you're going to say Zan Payne <laughs> yeah yeah I, was saying, I know people yeah, aren't going to like this <laughs> I know people aren't going to like this but no I mean I prefer at this point Curtis Williams over Trey White because if Curtis Williams is giving you uh, rebounds and assists like he has over the past three or four games then I think that he's a better player at this point than Trey White is. I really do because he stretches the floor. Uh, he's longer on defense. Uh, he can create possession, more possessions for you. Uh, and, and he has the size to crash the boards. Now, Trey White plays with this. He just, I feel like he just doesn't have awareness of, of his teammates around him. Like, I, I don't know if maybe the coaching staff put a lot of pressure on him to be the guy. And I, and again, I feel like it's kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth because he did go seven for seven in the last game. But for the most part, this is, that's a dude that likes to unload the clip. He's a guy that doesn't like to share the ball. He's a guy that the only reason that he wants to get a defensive rebound is so that he can bring it up the court and have the ball in his hands. And we talked about this in the off season. A lot of people said, Oh no, well Trey white can't play at the guard position because you know, he doesn't have experience bringing up the floor. He doesn't have experience initiating the offense. Like what? No, he did at USC, and he is now at Louisville. Now, granted, I, that's not what I prefer to have on, on the floor, just me. So I, I'm going to say I'm going with Curtis Williams over Trey White. Um, and then, obviously, you have Brandon at the, the five. I mean, may, maybe, you, maybe you throw Trey in at, at, at the three or four. And maybe you have Curtis, Trey, Mike James, uh, either Sky or Tyler, uh, and then Brandon. I, I think – that's probably the best lineup. I think you're obviously without JJ, you're a little weak at the four. So I don't know, what, what say you? Yeah, I think that's, that's a fine starting lineup. I'm with you. I mean, I think Mike James and Brandon Henley Hatfield are your stalwarts in the starting lineup. I, I don't think this, I don't think you can make a starting lineup that doesn't include those two. I honestly, preferably, I think a really interesting lineup that would be small would be sky Tyler, 
Mike James, Curtis Williams, and Brandon Huntley Hatfield. I know that's a really small lineup because I don't know who's guarding the four there. I guess it could be Mike James, but he's 6'5". He's undersized there. But, I mean, you get two – because, I mean, Curtis Williams is most effective when someone can get into the paint and create a shot for him. That's when he's the best. It's catch and it's shoot. That's when he's the most effective. And then you bring Trey White off the bench when you've got lesser skilled players there where maybe he can be a little bit more ball dominant and kind of swallow possessions up when we need it because he's coming off the bench and he's not granted. We don't really have the depth to not keep those starters in, but I think that'd be an interesting lineup, but just really anything that doesn't include Hersey Danilo or Zan Payne, I think would I would appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's a great way to put it. Uh, And what about Caleb Lynn? I mean, we, nobody ever talks about Caleb, but I mean, Dude is probably pound for pound Louisville's best rebounder. He does a lot of the little things that you know don't show up, show up on the stat sheet. What a what a stupid thing to not stupid thing to say, but what a what a cliche thing to say. He does all the stuff that you don't see on the stat sheet, but, but he more and more is uh, starting to remember rem- of um, of Dwayne Sutton the mm-hmm. way the way that he plays, where he's just kind of all, all over the place. We've seen him playing a lot at the five. But, I mean, at, at this point, that's a guy that you have to look at trying to get him 20 minutes a game. Uh, he was pivotal in that Miami game, uh, and he's played really solid of late. Uh, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing him. You know, it, that's the thing. When we get that that graphic before the game and you see Hersey Miller or you see Danilo Jovanovic or you see, um, who else, Zan Payne, makes you kind of want to blow your brains out because you have Caleb Glenn on the bench, because you have Curtis Williams on the bench, because you have Tyler Johnson on the bench. Like, that's that's really the, the concern. It's not, oh, no, not Zan Payne. It's, oh, no, not Zan Payne because there's other players that you could be putting in that lineup, Jake. And it doesn't – it's just it, – it seems silly. Like, I don't know if it's – he wants certain guys to come off the bench because they play better off the bench or whatever it is. But, like, right now you have to look at, at reality and it's that Louisville starting off terribly – and then he does the same shit. Like they'll get they'll get back into the game, right? They'll get back into the game with with a quality lineup, as we've just you know the, the the sort of lineups that we've discussed. And then they'll start the second half and they'll put put freaking Zan back in, put Hersey back in, the start of the second half. Like what is the point? Like what's the point of starting her? Like if you want Hersey to play, let Hersey play, right? But don't start him and then put him on the freaking bench for an hour and then put him back in the game and start the second half. What the fuck is that? Like it does, it, it, it logically does not make any sense. Like either you think that he's good enough to start, or you think that, uh, you know, he he should be sitting on the bench. It can't be both. It can't be both ways. And it doesn't yeah. make sense yeah. logically unless somebody's being punished. Unless we think that you know somebody, uh, you know, would be better coming off the bench. But don't just lie to us. Don't say you started Zan Payne and played minutes and he puts up zero 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 and one foul. And then tell us that he played good defense because you could just go look at the tape and know and understand that number one, he doesn't know where he's supposed to be. Number two, it's not fair to play a player like that at the highest level of college basketball. And number three, he's not giving any effort and he doesn't look like he's in any sort of shape to give effort. Like it, do, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It, it feels like a troll job to me. Yeah. The, of all people, if they want to get minutes, Hersey getting minutes starting, I obviously don't agree with. But if he wants to give him minutes, I I mean, I feel like the, the Hersey's talent level isn't there. He isn't so dramatically bad like a Zan Payne where you're like, what the hell is he doing on the court? And he gives enough he gives enough effort. So if he believes that Hersey Miller deserves eight minutes a game, I, I can understand that logic. But like you said, starting him for three minutes and then sitting him on the bench for 17 minutes and then starting him again for three minutes in the second half and then him never seeing the floor again makes no sense because clearly you he's not closing games out. You don't think he deserves those minutes, so it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and, and uh, there's always that that phrase like, oh, well, it's not about who starts. It's about who finishes. Well, it's kind of about who starts. Yeah, especially like, when, when you're, you're down, down 11 to 2. When you're down 11 to 15 to 4, 20 to 6. It's kind of about who fucking starts, Kenny. I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry to use profanity. I'm sorry if you have your kids in the car. But, like, what the hell? Like, it, it, there's no logic behind it whatsoever. It's literally like he's, like, playing. Like, he wants to bomb on, like, NBA, like, 2K my career type of thing. Like, it's, it's, it's like we're being trolled, Jake. It, does, it makes no sense. There's zero logic behind it. If you think that he's good enough to start, then you think he's good enough to play more than five minutes a game. And it's nothing against Hersey Miller. It's nothing against Zan Payne. It's nothing against Danilo Devonovich. 
that's fine. Those are the players that you chose to recruit. But if you think that they're good enough to start, they better, they better be playing. And they better be producing is the other thing. You can't play Zan Payne 17 minutes. He's a complete liability on defense. He doesn't get back. Like, I mean, that, that video is so damning of Louisville missing a shot. Zan, like, literally barely even jogging. And he's not even close to getting to midcourt before the opponent puts up a three-point shot. It doesn't make any sense. And also, the, the other logic behind it, too, like, we didn't even get in it, into this. Hersey Miller had played 27 minutes the entire season before you started him in a game. <laughs> How does that make any sense? He's playing less minutes in an entire season over the course of 20 games than other players that you're playing in that same game that play more minutes than, than, than what he'd already played. Make sense? Like, for instance, uh, you know, he, he'd only played 27 minutes the entire season, but you played Curtis Williams 31, but he doesn't start. How does that make any sense? You're putting yourself behind the eight ball. You're hurting yourself. It feels like intentionally. It feels like self-sabotage is what it feels like, Jake. And I, I just I'm, I'm, I'm tired of, you know, again, I, I'm not going to even acknowledge as we started, as we opened with, it does us no good. It, it does not serve us anything to even acknowledge the people that still want Kenny Payne to be here. But it also needs to be said that it, it's there, there's nothing redeemable about this at all. Nothing. Like we haven't even looked into the future. He's not even recruiting like he's going to be here. So as much as Kenny Payne says that, that, you know, uh, you know, that, that he, de he deserves another year because this is year one and all the other bullshit that you said in press conferences that are not even remotely true and a complete slap in the face to the entire fan base. Not only that, but he's not looking to the future. He's not. And it's just, it, it, it's, it's scary and, and mind blowing. And I just want it to end. I'm just tired of it. I think other fans feel the same way. I understand the, nobody understands 99.8% uh, of people understand the money aspect of it than me, because I spend hours and hours going over this stuff. But at what point do you have to look at the good of what brand you have left? Like at, at one point, what, at what point do you start, you know, weigh the options here and see like, even if you got to pay him the full $8 million buyout, is it not, does it not serve you better to just get him out and figure the financials out down the road? Because we're looking at a, a very scary scenario where some of the best coaches that are are on the market are may not be available in three or four months when Louisville's looking, uh, and and that that's the scariest part for me, Jake. Any kind of final thoughts as we head into Duke and and the great beyond? Uh, I'll be at the game on Tuesday. I've got a buddy who lives in Nashville. He's a big Duke fan, so uh, I'm going to take him up. This is the first time he's been to the Yum Center, so he's excited. Kind of warned him it's not the exact same environment that he may have envisioned, um, but I'm sure he'll be happy right. when we probably inevitably lose this game by double digits. Um, I'm looking forward to KP starting Aiden McCool next game and truly <laughs> confirming to me that he's doing it all on purpose and he's trying to see how much it takes to get fired. Uh, but besides that, I'll I'll keep watching and probably re-watching until I go mad. Yeah, I think uh, so as far as I know, I think that, Sky and Brandon are the only two players that have started every game. Does that sound right? Maybe Mike? Yeah, maybe Mike, unless he, uh, he's he gotten hurt before in a game, but I don't know if he's ever missed a game. So, yeah, maybe Mike as well. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm looking forward to Aiden McCool, Zan Payne, Danilo Jovanovic, uh, Manu Korofor coming back from injury. Mm -hmm. uh, who else can we throw in there? Who plays oh, the least out of everybody else left? Caleb Glenn. Throw Caleb Glenn in there. Why not? We probably got a team manager that could get in there too. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Or, or does Nolan have any eligibility left? Let's get him in there. <laughs> Nolan would be a killer Might on this team. Might as well. Look, we're going to be, I think, brutally honest with you guys going forward um, and allow this to be your therapy session, right? Like if somebody wants to come on and vent, I'll give you, I'll give you five minutes to come on and vent. Let's do it, man. Why not? Uh, we're in unprecedented times, so we might as well just, maybe set up a call call in line or something like just do a little Louisville basketball therapy. Cause that's what this is becoming. Right. Uh, you know, I'm very jealous of the, the pink seats guys that just go on and they talk about all the fun stuff that's happening with football. And then they talk about, Oh yeah. During the, during the podcast, we got two more, you know, 
flips from Ole Miss. Like, it's just constant positivity, and it couldn't be any more opposite of what we're talking about with global basketball. I will say brighter days are ahead. Uh, we are nearing the end. 13 games left in the season. Uh, Jake, thank you for taking your time to vent with me. Uh, until <laughs> next time, starting 502 Podcast, make sure you go out and grab some Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon today. Lord knows we all need it. Let's get out of here and go cards. I'm sending you a therapy bill after this one. <laughs>